Last week, um, we were talking about rituals. We were talking about sacraments as rituals. And on one hand, I was tearing them down. And on the other hand, I was holding them up. And I want to continue on with that um, thread because there was, there's more to be said about rituals and about sacraments. A ritual sacrament we defined as an outward expression of an inward transformation. And it's really important for us to understand this because as we were talking last week, the ritual itself, the sacrament itself, the actual form, the thing that we do, the words that we say, the actions that we take are meaningless in and of themselves, whether it's baptism or whether it's Eucharist or whether it's uh, marriage, holy orders, whatever, it is the transformed heart coming to the ritual, coming to the sacrament, that imbues it with meaning. And this is so important for us to understand. The transformed heart, what we bring, it is what brings meaning to the ritual. And then the ritual conveys that meaning to the community and binds us together in shared experience and shared meaning. And so it's kind of a closed loop. And it's so important for us to get this. But just like, you remember in The Wizard of Oz, Oz didn't give nothing to the Tin Man that he didn't already have. It's like we need to bring meaning. We need to bring the transformation that we are experiencing in our walk with God to the ritual, or the ritual itself will end up being meaningless. Now, obviously, this is the tearing down part of the sacraments, trying to right-size them, get them right in our perspective so that we can use them correctly in everything we do, because rituals and sacraments are absolutely necessary, both in terms of our communal lives and our individual lives. But we need to know how to use them, how they function. First of all, they're never ends in themselves. If they were, if we thought that this string of words could somehow affect God, that would be a superstition. That would be a way of us reimagining our sense of control or our ability to control things that we can't control. They're God's domain. This is where we become dependent. This is where we become powerless. This is where we become vulnerable. This is where we submit ourselves to things that we can't know or understand. And the ritual can bring that home to us if we're not imagining it in the wrong way. And I got Jesus to back me up on this. I mean, you can put them up if you want to. I'm not going to actually read them. But at Matthew 5, around verse 23, this is where Jesus says, if you're going to leave your gift at the altar... Okay, so this is a very set religious practice of taking a sacrifice to the altar. This is their purity code. This is how they became pure again when they had become unclean. So he's going to the altar, and there he remembers he has something against his brother. Jesus says, leave the gift at the altar. Go reconcile with your brother, and then come back if you want to and, and burn the bird, you know, whatever it is you want to do. But the thing is, that gift is meaningless if the relationship is broken. If the heart is compromised, that ritual is not going to make it right. The ritual is where we publicly celebrate the transformation that we're undergoing. And then at Mark 12, verse 28, this is where Jesus is questioned about the greatest commandment. And he answers that it's to love God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer who asks him the question praises him for such a great answer. He says, that's absolutely right, what you just said. He said, nothing else matters. All the burnt offerings don't matter in the face of just that love. That's it. It is that love, that transformation that moving and being able to see things from a different perspective that brings meaning to our rituals and to our sacraments. And then my favorite, Micah 6, eight. This is where he's talking about, you know, what is the Lord really requiring of us? Is it, bur is it burnt offerings? Is that what is going on? Does God really care about the yearling calf, about a 1,000 rams being sacrificed? Does God really care about 10,000 rivers of oil being burned? Oh, no. All God cares about is that you do justice, that you love kindness, that you walk humbly with your God. That's the part that God is after. 
That doesn't mean that the rituals of the sacraments are unnecessary. But it means that we got to get the cart before the horse. We've got to understand this is the way they work. Now, you know, if that's the case, you might ask, well, then why do we do them? Why even bother with them if everything is really happening internally anyway? And maybe I could ask you, what's your impression of ritual anyway? When you think about ritual, when you think about religion, when you think about organized church, is it a positive or negative first reaction that you have? See, for most of us, it's negative. We talk about ritual being empty. We talk about ritual being meaningless, absurd even, the things that we do. Ex-Catholics, like me, you know, we remember all the ritual because the, the liturgy and the ritual is a centerpiece of worship in the Catholic Church, Episcopal Church, you know, High Lutheran Church, all those have those liturgical-based, there's so much liturgy and ritual that is absolutely beautiful, but it didn't mean anything to us as kids. It was never really explained to us as kids. We didn't know what was going on. When I was a kid, the priest was still facing the other way, and everything was in Latin. What kind of meaning did that have for me, you know? Oh, yeah, in the 60s, they turned him around and he started speaking English. That helped a little bit, but still didn't get it. You know, what in the world is going on with all of this stuff? And so we tend to denigrate ritual. We tend to even ridicule it as being empty, as being meaningless, as being even cultish. It doesn't do any good. And all of that is true if the ritual, if the sacrament is done thoughtlessly, if it's done just to obey or to conform to the practice, to the religion, to the church, to the family, whoever is instituting it. And also, if we're just doing it to gain approval, if we're doing it to gain standing, if we're doing it so people will think well of us, there is no meaning there. And that's what Jesus was doing, so much battle to try to get across to the people to understand. In a first century Judaism, which was based on ritual and liturgy, and sacrament. But what if your ritual, what if your sacrament isn't any of those things? What if it's something completely different? I said I was an ex-Catholic, and oh, it's getting to be a long time ago. Um, I don't know, a couple decades ago, I attended a, a Catholic funeral mass. And I hadn't been to a, a Catholic mass in some time, except for funerals and weddings. I mean, that ends up where you end up going, right? And I was sitting there through this Mass, and next to me was a young man, he was probably, I don't know how old he was, probably in his late 20s at the time, who had just converted to the Episcopal Church. And he was all hot and on fire, you know, and everything. I don't know, he must have sensed it from me, just, I don't know if it was my body language or something about, he leans over and whispers to me in the middle of the Mass, do you miss the liturgy? He sensed it in me, because that's exactly what I was thinking at the time. Or maybe not even thinking it in words, but I was thinking, ah, oh, how I've missed this. You know when you walk back into something that you haven't been in in such a long time and it just feels like a warm blanket? It's how I felt. There's something comforting about the same words being said at the same spot, in the same place, on the same day, that, that draws us back, helps us grow deep roots do you miss the liturgy? This ritual form, if you don't know what a liturgy is, it's a ritual form of public worship in liturgical churches like the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, and, and high Protestant churches. And of course, it's, it's the Mass. There is the liturgy of the Word where all the reading is done. There's the liturgy of the Eucharist where the Eucharist is celebrated just kind of like we did today, but much more elaborately. As you can tell, this is the holding up part of liturgy, of ritual, of sacrament, because we all need ritual in our lives. Yes, it is comforting, but it's also steadying. It does something in our lives. It creates repeatable patterns in our lives that hold us down, make us reliable. I remember in my 20s, for whatever reason, my parents stopped going to Mass in uh, my early teens. And so I hadn't been to Mass through my teenage years, through high school. Uh, I entered a monastery, I entered a religious order at the end of uh, my high school term. 
and didn't stay very long, realized it wasn't my vocation. When I left the order, I also left the church, not on purpose. I was just bent on other things. And there was a period uh, of about, I don't know, 14, 15 years before I re-entered Christianity, but then in an evangelical setting, which kind of blew my mind. But uh, it felt comforting coming back to Jesus. But I remember through my 20s, every Sunday afternoon, I would fall into this deep depression. And it was like clockwork. Every Sunday afternoon, I would feel this. And I didn't realize it was happening for probably years. But after a while, it's like, Sunday afternoon. Why is it always Sunday afternoon? And then I'd wait for it, and there it would be, Sunday afternoon. Until in my 30s, when I started going back to church again, after this long search, ended up back in, now in evangelical church. I wasn't coming back to the liturgy, but I went back to church, and suddenly... The depression was lifted on Sunday afternoons. And I didn't even think about that for a while. But all of a sudden, I realized that I was missing the Sunday morning ritual. I was missing the sacrament that I had grown up. And it wasn't just the Mass itself. There was kind of an extended liturgy that my family was involved in. Yeah, you know, the whole family, we'd all get up. We'd all get dressed up because back in the 60s, that's what you did. You know, you got dressed up to go to church. And we would go and we would have the, the mass. And then after the mass, we would go to, I remember it was always Paris Restaurant, which is across the street and just a little bit down from the church. And they had this rotisserie chickens always turning in the window. And so here I am, you know, I'm about hip high, looking up at these chickens turning. I can still see them if I close my eyes and go in and have pancakes, you know. Every Sunday, like clockwork, the same thing, the same time, and then all of a sudden it's gone. And I'm here in my 20s without my family, moved out on my own, and something in me knew that there was this big piece missing. That ritual was gone, and it needed to be replaced with something. It wasn't replaced with the Catholic liturgy, but it was replaced with another ritual, another way of doing things. I had lost that sense of security. I had lost that sense of place and belonging in my life. And I needed to come back to something that reset it. Think about the rituals in your life. Do you have rituals in your life? You do, and you probably don't even think of them as such. Do you have a morning ritual? Do you do the same things in the same order every day when you get up or close to it? I mean, what do you do when you get up? How many times do you hit the snooze button before you finally get out of bed, you know? Do you have a set number of times? I do. Said I can hit it this many times, and that's kosher. After that, I got to get up, you know? And then what do you do? Do you tend to the dog first or to the coffee first? I mean, what's the most important thing? Do you get the dog done? Do you get the coffee done? Do you go to the bathroom? Well, what is it that you do? And do you have a ritual for the coffee? Because we have a very specific way that we make coffee at home, and it's got to be that way because we know that's what tastes good. You know, and it goes in this order. And then how do you put the toothpaste on the toothbrush? You know, is it just a dab? Do you do a whole line across the whole brush? You know, how do you go up and down, side to side? I mean, all these things that we don't even think about are rituals. But think about how locked in you are. And then you can extend that to your commute to work. Think about the rituals and think about how comforting that is. And when you have to miss that ritual for whatever reason, something intrudes and breaks up the ritual, doesn't it kind of discombobulate you for the day? These rituals are important for us as human beings. This is what we do. They're comforting in that they are steadying. They are regular. They are reliable. And all of that is really, really good. You have come to expect us to be here every Sunday morning because that's our ritual. And John and I and the band, we have a ritual before you even get here of what we do and how we set things up. And, and, and it's all part of our extended liturgy, our extended ritual. And what we do here in the morning, this is a ritual, certainly not as elaborate as a liturgical church because we're not liturgical, but we have the same form that we do. We have our announcements, we have our band, we have worship. We talked a little bit about worship, but there's a whole shape to the worship that we're trying to hit that is part of this, and then our message, and then our time for just fellowship. We go to lunch afterward. This is our ritual here. This is our liturgy here, and it's so important. You know, there was a study that said 
that when you were doing personal grooming, like brushing your teeth, for us, 90% of the time that we're doing something like that, we're thinking about something else. Think about it. Are you ever really thinking about brushing your teeth when you're brushing your teeth? So we're not aware of the ritual while we're doing it, just like we can come to church and be just as unaware of the ritual as I was as a kid going into church and having to endure the liturgy, you know, and just waiting for pancakes on the other side because I didn't understand what was really going on. But if we can start to bring awareness and intention back into what we're doing while we're doing it, everything starts to change. Even something as simple as brushing your teeth. Thich Nhat Hanh, who just died just a few months ago, the famous Vietnamese monk and, and author and mystic, he said, you know, when you're washing the dishes, really wash the dishes. Wash the dishes. We usually wash the dishes so we can get to something else. It's just a task that we have to perform. But if you really were to wash the dishes and tactily feel everything that's going on, you know, the viscosity of the soap and the, the, the touch and the feel, and you could just be present. It could transform the washing of the dishes. It could transform the brushing of your teeth. It could transform the coffee and the dog and the ritual that we do. And it can certainly transform what goes on in a space like this. Brother Lawrence, whom I've talked about so often, was a master at this, realizing that we don't have to invent ways to come at God. We just do what we normally do all day long, but for the sake of God, with awareness of God's presence. He said, I could pick up a straw off the ground, and it's a sacred act if I do it for my God. It's that continuous prayer of Paul that imbues all of these rituals, not just the formal ones, but all of them in our lives with meaning, with purpose, and with a sense of something more there, something else that is coming. So, it's steady, it's regular, it's good, but it's not enough. We need to have that meaning. We need to bring our intentionality so that we can find the purpose, find the meaning. We need to know what our rituals actually mean both formally, communally, and also personally and subjectively. The two best masses that I ever attended in my entire life were in my mid-30s when I was spending a lot of time at Sarah Retreat in Malibu with the Franciscans and the Catholics up there. That was a place I discovered that I could go and just book a room and just be. And I went there as often as I could because I was just so trying to figure things out. And I befriended two of the priests there, and I could just get time with them in their office and talk. And it was, it was just, they were mentors. They were, they, I can't tell you how much they meant to me. But right after they finished, they, they were building a new chapel. It was great, octagonal, all glass on the front that looked out over the ocean from the back of Malibu Canyon. And the, the first mass that I was there, one of my friends there, Emery Tang, who was also the retreat director, um, said the mass. But what he did was he explained every single thing that he was doing while he was doing it. So normally the, the, the priest is wordless as he's doing just the housekeeping on the altar and, and the chalice and the, 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 all the pieces of cloth and the patent and all the different things that are going on. He explained everything and the reason behind it the symbolism and what that meant. And it just transformed the liturgy. It just brought it home in such a way that I hadn't experienced before. And so I got a sense of the formal understanding of the liturgy and the ritual of the Mass. And then the other one was about 6 o'clock in the morning in what I suppose was their little baptism chamber. It was all tiled. It looked like the inside of a shower, and it could probably only hold about, you know, maybe soaking wet, maybe 15 people, and there was a, a, a baptismal font in the middle. And it was just hard tiled benches all the way around the perimeter of the room. And I think there was four of us sitting there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I was sitting right next to the priest, and we were just side by side in this circular room at 6 o'clock in the morning, sitting right next to the priest, and experiencing the Mass from the inside out instead of from afar, it was amazing. He didn't explain anything he was doing. He said the Mass, but it had a personal and subjective meaning to me that still lives in my memory however many years later since it's been. See, we need both. 
We need to know the meaning of the symbols that we as a community have decided upon and maybe decided upon for millennia that have been handed down to us. We need to know what those symbols are because that's what binds us together as a group, binds us together as a people, allows us to have shared experience and shared meaning. But beyond that, we have to get to a place where the meaning of our ritual becomes personal for each one of us. It has to start working from the inside out as well as the outside in. How do we apply the formal shared meaning of our liturgy, of our ritual, of our sacraments? And how does that change us in the rituals that we place for ourselves, in the decisions we make, in our attitudes for life, and the quality of our relationships? After um, last Sunday's message, I got to talk to a woman who said that she had a kind of an epiphany as she was listening to the message because she realized she didn't have any rituals in her life. She hadn't been able to either place them or hadn't been able to replace them. And I was so thrilled that she made that connection that it's not just the rituals that are given to us by the communities in which we live, but also the rituals that we place in our own path, that we build for ourselves, that are so meaningful and so necessary for us, that that's why I wanted to talk about this further. As I said, you know, we tend to denigrate church and, and religion and ritual because we're focusing on how badly it's been done. And of course it's been done badly. But why have humans, for as long as we've been on the face of the earth, since we were painting on cave walls, why have we always had ritual, liturgy? Why is it so important that every culture, everywhere, every when, develops their own religions, rituals, sacraments? Because when religion is done well, it gives us this reliable, repeatable forms of a structured community, and that's the key. The community needs to be structured, and it's structured around the ritual, around these repeated forms. Human life revolves around this, revolves around this structured community. Whether it's a family, whether it's a church, whether it's a workplace, doesn't matter, but without that, we're lost. In the ancient world, without that, you did not survive. To be put outside the city gates, the city walls was tantamount to a death sentence because you couldn't survive on your own. And so that structured community was everything. We don't feel that as strongly now with our technology and with our society the way that it is. But human life revolves around structured community and we will never find lasting meaning without it. Meaning that fulfills our souls, meaning that fulfills our lives cannot be found without a structured community, to give it context, to give it place, to give it connection. And as I said, this structured community doesn't have to be religious. This doesn't mean that you have to go to a church, but it must be structured, right? And it must be communal. You've probably heard my rant about the five essentials that every one of us needs in order to have a fulfilled life. And that's a community, accountability, structure, discipline, and service. Those five are absolutely essential. So the idea is we need a structured community, so those community and structure. But if we're not disciplined to the structure, if we're not showing up, then of what good is it? As yes, I was talking to one person, he said, yeah, I have this group that I go to once a month. I said, well, that's not enough. You know, once a month is not going to do it. A structured community needs to meet at least once a week, and hopefully more than that, two to three times a week would be better but at least once a week, that gives us a sense of connection, gives us a sense of throughput. And so you have to be disciplined to the structure of the community. You actually have to show up to it. And when you do show up to it, it's not just being a wallflower or just checking off a box that you actually went, but it's coming early and having conversations and taking names and numbers and staying late and doing the same thing so that eventually, if you don't show up to a meeting, everyone's gonna notice and they're going to call you to find out if you're okay. That's accountability. And of course, if you are doing that well, if you are actually present to community in an accountable way and disciplined to the structure, there's going to be a never-ending flow of opportunities for service. And when we give back, then the whole loop closes. The circuit closes. 
and we see the meaning of what is going on here. This can be done in your family. This can be done in your work group, your church group, sports groups, teams, right? Schools, in the arts. Drama would be a great way that we can see all of these five happening. 12-step groups, of course social groups, even groups that are centered around immersive hobbies, all of these can be so beneficial if they are structured. Then they can provide what we're looking for. So when we provide structure from the outside in, it's beneficial if we are moving beyond just mere obedience, moving beyond just mere compliance, because if we're just showing up because we need to, because we have to, because it's advantageous for us to do so, that's not enough. It's like someone coming to a 12-step meeting because they have to fill out a court card. You know, That's not going to take them where they really need to go in recovery. But with the repetition, we begin to see the meaning in what we're doing. We begin to see the purpose in the structure. We begin to see how it works in our lives and how it's working for us personally. If we're really paying attention, if we really are accountable and disciplined, and then we begin to see the task within the task, not just the outward events and activities that the group is doing, but underneath, what is that universal task within all of the tasks that we do as human beings throughout our lives? And of course, that's connection. It is a connection that is a task within the task. Now, we may love the surfing, the music, the breakfast, of whatever it is that we are, are is the reason for our gathering and our, for our structured community. But we begin to see that the connection and the unity that is formed is what's really going on. You know, Mary was talking about Nina. Nina and I have been joined at the hip for about 13 years doing ministry and recovery and, and uh, treatment centers and whatnot. And we had a ritual way that we would connect throughout the week. And now that ritual is blown up. You know? So we're kind of off balance right now, and we're trying to find new ways to start to ritualize our connection points because it's so important. Not just for her as she's going through what she's going through, but for me. You, know? you feel off balance. Just like when you get your morning routine blown up, you feel off balance when the ritual and con the ritualized connections, the regular and repeatable and reliable connections in your life are pulled out. You feel the difference. And so, like this woman that I was telling you about, to see the importance of creating our own personal rituals as well as the ones that we submit to in group and in communal settings is what starts to structure us from the inside out, begins to balance and equalize the exterior structure as well. And the whole thing starts to work together, allows us to start to bring a personal meaning, that inward transformation that we're talking about, to the outward expression, to the ritual, to the group experience. And it enriches and brings the whole thing to life. It's all about awareness. How aware do we become as we are doing the things that we do every day? Like Brother Lawrence said, just do the things that you do every day. If you bring awareness, if you bring presence to them, things become changed. We become aware of this deeper meaning in the ritual practices that have none to bring of their own accord. But by submitting to the ritual and the structure of the group and the community, we become part of something that is greater than ourselves, and we feel the difference. We feel the connection. We also feel the humility and the vulnerability and even the dependence that when we submit to something greater than ourselves brings. That meaning that I'm talking about is usually not clear at first, but it grows. And if the group is doing well, what the group needs to do. It is always funneling each member, member, leading each member to a personal structure and a personal epiphany, personal connection. And hopefully the group is teaching and encouraging that as well. But it doesn't necessar necessarily have to, overtly. Now, the church should be. And it's really sad that the church has not really taught these principles, has not taught 
contemplative practice and a way for us to build these structures. But thankfully, more and more churches are coming around to doing this again. More and more voices are coming back to this understanding of spiritual formation, this understanding of spiritual direction. And so as we build our personal structure, what is that going to look like? Well, it can be your own study, your own reading. It can be your own devotions, your quiet time in the mornings or whenever it happens to be. It can be the four S's that we talk about, silence, solitude, stillness, simplicity, building that up in your lives, both offline in times that you carve out and online through just mindful presence through everything that you do, but developing more a sense of that. It's in your prayer life, it's in your meditation, it's in your mindful presence that you practice. All of those, if they're structured, become ritual for you, but they have to actually be structured. You have to start writing them down. You have to have times and days that you do the same thing at the same time for it to become like a circadian rhythm that your body gets used to somatically as well as you actually consciously becoming aware of what you're doing. It becomes, as we become more and more of this awareness of meaning and purpose and identity, we realize it's only possible with ritual, with regularly repeated acts, acts in a series, in a set manner of our own making. That is what the ritual does for us, and that takes practice. Because it's only when we do something and can do something without thinking about it anymore, it gets so into our muscle memory that we can just do it automatically, that we can be completely present to that act, to that action. Think about music. If you're still thinking about where your fingers go, if you're still thinking about how you need to blow into, if you're still thinking about theory, you'd be able to make sounds, but are you really making music? Are you really present to the actual creative process? And is your listener able to connect with you on that level as well? Sports, of course, if you're still thinking about the mechanics of what you do, how can you actually perform? And how can you perform under pressure? Drama, you know, have you got your lines so well <laughs> memorized that they just come to you and they sound like your own voice? like a thought that you just had, or are they still mechanically being thought in your mind? A new language that you learn, are you still struggling to translate in your mind before you squeak out the words? Or have you gotten to the point where you're thinking in the new language and it just flows so your thoughts come out? Prayer is the same way. Are we still thinking about it? Or have we practiced it enough that it is a part of who we are, that the prayer is now saying us rather than we saying the prayer? The only way to be completely present to a person is to know them well enough or at least know ourselves well enough that we don't have to think about the relationship and how we should be acting. When we get into that mode and start treating our relationship like chess games, having to think three steps ahead and so on and so forth, three moves, we've already left the ability to simply be present to the relationship, be present to another person. When we don't have to think about anything and we can just be, that's when we can be present. And it's the same with God. Practicing presence with God is a ritual that we absolutely need so that we can just let everything go and we can just be present. Nothing is standing in the way between us and the experience of God's presence. And when you think about Jesus and you think about him as a first century Jew, his life was radically structured as Jewish life was and still is if you're really going to be orthodox about it. But in the first century, everything that you did in life was structured by ritual, was structured by the liturgy. You had regular times. You had the Sabbath, of course, once a week, but you had other times that you went to synagogue. And in the synagogue, there were cycles of readings, the parasha, the haftarah, the readings from the Torah, the readings from the prophets that were set on an annual or three-year cycle. 
And so those were regular things that you did every single time. And everybody knew what they were, what those Torah portions were. And so they would say them. There was structured time for prayer that was broken up throughout the day. Calls to prayer where you had to come and pray. There were pilgrimage festivals, five of those a year. Well, while the temple still stood, all the males had to descend back on Jerusalem and go to temple and perform their ritual actions there. Everything was structured. The dietary codes, what you ate, how you prepared it, the purity codes, what you did, how you cleaned everything, how you presented yourself as pure to the priests after you had become unclean. All of these were structured. All of these were codes, and Jesus kept them all. Every non-rabbinical ritual, code, law, Jesus kept. But here's the catch. There's always a catch, right? If we know these things well enough that we don't have to think about them, that can make us absolutely present. But it can also put us to sleep. And that's up to us, right? When you know something so well that you don't have to think about it, you can do it in your sleep. Often we do, right? And so which way are you going to go with this? It is the practice that makes us present to the reality and the truth behind and the meaning behind the ritual, but it can also lose meaning for us again if we're not bringing our intentionality to it or if we get distracted by other focus, by other conflicts of interest, let's say. You know, this is where Jesus came into conflict with the Pharisees. And just to give you a flavor of this at Matthew 23, starting at verse 23, this is the substance of all his conflict. The lost meaning of the ritual that was now getting between the people and their God, because these were their teachers, these were their religious lawyers, and they were leading him down the wrong path. And these are all the woes that Jesus says, and he gets as, as adversarial as he gets anywhere in the Gospels. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. And so he's already setting up. You do all the tithes. You do everything assiduously, every little bit of the law and every requirement you do but you are missing the weightier provisions, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guys who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. So the gnat was the smallest unclean animal known to the Jews, and the camel was the largest unclean animal, at least Palestinian Jews. Babylonian Jews had elephants, but... You can see where Jesus is going with this. They would literally put Muslim over their cups before they poured a liquid into it to strain out the unclean gnat because for them to swallow that unawares would make them unclean, right? But he says you strain the gnat, but you swallow the camel because of the things that you're doing. Jesus is a master at using words. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. These were the purity codes, the cleanliness codes, where everything, hands had to be washed, everything had to be clean. First clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs on which the outside appear beautiful, but, the inside, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And you can imagine this didn't go over very well. Jesus is nearing the end of the rope for himself as far as they were concerned. But the Pharisees had lost their meaning. And these rituals that they had perfected and taken to a, a fine art, they had still lost the meaning in the conflict of interest that they were faced with. They fell asleep to the original intent of the ritual as they were focused on non-spiritual goals. They were focused on feathering their own nests on getting the good seats at the table, at being seen as righteous, and of course, getting remuneration. And they lost the presence to the moment. They lost the presence to their community. They lost their presence and their awareness of the people and their needs, which means they lost sight of service and they lost sight of any kind of sense of love because they were all twisted around 
And Jesus' message here is not to abolish the law, not to abolish ritual, not to abolish these practices because he maintained them to the end of his life. Absolutely. He kept all of these. His message is to find the freedom, the salvation, which to a Jew is spiritual liberation right here and right now, in the midst of and through the ritual practice, the practice of obeying of law, but to instill the meaning in them at the same time. The only way we can do this is to wake up. We have to wake up in our moments and realize what ritual is doing, how important it is to begin to see the rituals that we already have in place and sanctify those with our presence, with our awareness. Whether it's feeding the dogs or brushing our teeth, it can be a sacred act if we bring to that ritual that sense of grounding, our own presence, and how we meet God's presence in that as we serve and do the things that we do to become aware. Everything begins and ends with submitting to some sort of ritual. It's what we do. Our lives are based on routine and ritual. No matter how dramatic you may think your life is or how dramatic somebody else's life looks, either in the media or on Facebook, if you really break it down, if you could see their life from the inside out, it is routine every day sunrise, sunset, and everything that we do in between. If we can wake up, if we can become aware, we can realize how ritual plays this important part in our lives because in between the beginning and the end is that awakening, that ability to see the task within the task and God's hands and feet on the ground in our lives in the moments. And so the key here is not to miss everything that God is showing us through our rituals by missing the sacred ritual itself or feeling that we don't need it or denigrating it in any way to embrace it and to give it the meaning that will change us from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all these forms, ancient forms, new forms, communal forms, personal forms. Help us to see them for what they are. Your gift to us. Your gift of us being able to find the stability, the reliability, the trustworthiness that we need to be able to go through life that is so uncertain where we don't get the answers that we want. And yet we can return to our practice and our rituals, and in them find the answers that we need, which is the truth of the connection, which is the truth of the love that will make us free from our fears. Help us to build new rituals for ourselves, and imbue them with meaning. Help us to see the rituals that we're already involved in and cherish them in ways that we haven't before because we see how they connect us and how they build a sense of belonging and security and family in an uncertain world. And thank you for your presence in all of it, in everything that we do. And we pray that through our new appreciation for ritual, that we will see more and more clearly that you are involved in every moment. Thank you for your love and constancy, Father. And never let us forget, we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.